Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to this month's episode of the Broker Breakdown. We are coming close to the holiday season, and everything is kind of wrapping up for the year. But we do have one final guest on the podcast this 2023. Um, He is actually our biggest episode this year was with him back in January. And again, there's been a lot of changes since that conversation. Um, especially in the automotive industry. So I definitely wanted him to get him back on. He is a very good friend of mine. We golf a lot. Um, so I just really wanted him to get him back on. So please welcome back, Doug. Hey, James. Thank you so much for, for having me on again. That's that's interesting to know that the uh, the listenership on the episode was good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. That's what we want is uh, you know for your podcast to, to grow and, and impact people's lives positively. And so I'm very glad to hear that, and we yeah we started off the year together well, and now we're we're closing on uh, on a high note too. Hopefully. Yeah, you know so. what? I didn't even I didn't honestly I knew that we kind of I knew we kind of recorded either at the end of last year or the beginning of this year. So it's just kind of like funny how we kind of started the year off with you, and now we're ending the year off with you. <laughs> Great. Everything comes full circle, and exactly and, uh, yeah, you you alluded to it. A lot has changed, and. Just in case there's some, some new listeners or, or anything like that, I'm happy to give a bit of background on who I am, where I'm coming from. So again, as you mentioned, my name is Doug Bricknell. I'm from Wayne Pittman Ford Lincoln in the Guelph Auto Mall. So it's a, a multi-generational uh, family-owned and operated business in Guelph, Ontario. So um, yeah, it's, it's been it's been great to, uh, and thanks again, James, for having me on to, to build this relationship. And yeah, the, you know, we have a lot of fun sort of outside of the office as well and on the golf course and whatnot. Uh, but from a professional perspective, too, always appreciate your uh, your help and advice, and uh, and uh, I'm always happy to share what I can from from the automotive industry. So, yeah, is there anything off the top that you'd like to to get into? Yeah, I think the first thing I, did, I really wanted to jump into because we we kind of talked a lot about this last time in January, where obviously we saw a, obviously a big shift in the market share where a lot of clients were going more to the electric vehicle side of things and i could easily say um i think ford was a big driver in that even if you're looking at a lot of the competition uh again you know me personally like i drive a dodge or a ram they have like almost like no well i guess they just came out with plans to release an ev in the next coming years but you guys already had that in place for many years prior and even now like even if i'm driving down the road like the electric f-150 like you see all the time right so it seems like you guys are a little bit farther ahead so do you guys really credit yourself to being like one of those driving forces in the electric vehicle sector yeah well thanks james i think it's definitely a a double-edged sword it's it's good to be a leader in some ways because then you get to really sort of uh carve your own path and and be seen as an innovative company which which Ford really wants to be although it's an old company in terms of you know its history uh, it wants to stay on on the cutting edge and keep improving keep keep revolutionizing things um but at the same time too you sometimes uh you know there when you're launching something new um you're you're not sure how it's going to be received by consumers and they're they're people who really love their EVs and they they've been uh big advocates for it and a lot of good early adopters and then we've shifted even beyond the earlier adoption phase now to more mass adoption not quite as much mass adoption as we were hoping to see by this point but you know some of that can be attributed to uh to economic factors and and again a lot has changed since we last spoke you know uh economically uh interest rates we don't have to get into too many of the details there everybody's pretty aware of, of the situation that we're in and a lot of folks are feeling that budgetary uh, crunch that that I think was by design, um, but we're we're certainly experiencing it now in in uh, in terms of vehicle sales and and the conversations that we're having with with guests coming into the store. Um, more than ever, people are looking to to save some money, and uh, so you know uh, it's, it's a tough decision whether or not to buy a new car, keep your existing car. So. Maybe we can uh, we can get into a little bit of that too. If if you plan on buying a new one, here are some tips. And then if you plan on keeping your current one, here are some ways you can help make that sustainable as as well. But but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be uh, you know uh, associated with Ford and and the way that they've 
really started to um, I, you know explore the, the EV space and, and give options to people. You know, it's not just EVs. There's also a lot of great hybrid options that I think we've noticed a, an increased interest in those. Maybe if folks aren't ready to make the jump into full electric vehicle living, um, they can get a plug-in hybrid or a, or a standard hybrid that doesn't require any charging. And it's a good sort of appetizer for the uh, the entree of an EV to come in the future um, as the technology improves, uh, range improves, um, everything like that. So, and I think it's good for Ford to. There, it's happening in real time, so they're they're working out the kinks on on some of the designs. But overall, the the feedback that we've received from people that own them has been quite positive, especially with the Lightnings, as you said, James. Uh, those are those have been really great uh, for folks who want a truck, but also want to want an EV. So, yeah. Well, in the summertime, I know you you were part of the uh, the charity event that I did for the, the golf tournament that I did. That's right. Yeah. You did for bring, Ducks Unlimited. That was a great time. You did bring the Mach E by, which was great. And the I always, I always keep thinking about this. I don't know why it's this is stuck in my head for so long. But what you called the front end of the vehicle? Do you remember what you called the like the front? Yeah, trunk? it's called the the, the frunk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that's stayed frunky. that has stayed with me literally since you've told me that. And it's just like you know what, like with those kind of things, like it just it's it's just so funny, like the kind of terms that we kind of coin up for certain things like that, right? Because again, like you don't need there's no engine, right? So it's not like you really that whole area is really just now a big extra storage space, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, thanks again for the opportunity to be there. It was a, it was a fantastic event. And I was glad to see that, uh, you know, we were able to raise some good money for uh, for Ducks Unlimited and onward and upward with that. But um, yeah, the opportunity to have a vehicle there to open up the front to, to show people the interior of the vehicle as well, uh, I think is a is a great way because um, for, for folks to experience it in a, a no obligation setting where they can see it, touch it, feel it. Um, and, and not be, have the pressure of, oh, this is a test drive at a car dealership, you know, um, it's a different relaxed environment. Um, because I, we take it for granted sometimes when we work in the industry, you know, our exposure to the vehicles, we're around them all the time, but some people had never seen one, right. Or never, uh, uh, really had the chance to inspect one. So I think the more that we, um, as an education piece, the more we give people exposure to the vehicles, we're, we're actually talking about setting up some events where it's just kind of like a a driving experience or almost like a car care course for folks who want to learn more about it, not necessarily trying to sell them a vehicle just so that they understand the technology, how it works, how it can fit into their lifestyle. Because again, the internet is a, a wild and wonderful place. There's all kinds of information out there, some of it more accurate than uh, than others uh so that's for sure that's for sure <laughs> yeah it's tough to know who to listen to sometimes but it, that way i think if we could get people experiencing it for themselves um that way they can draw their own conclusions and hopefully they're they're positive and like i i think again me i i obviously drive a competitor's vehicle but i think it, i'd be silly not to say this but again i think not only just from a like product standpoint, but I think Ford obviously holds a huge brand, right? Like when you think of car companies, I guarantee if you ask 10 people, I guarantee probably at least half will say Ford every single time. So I think what you guys not have only done with the product, but also like with the branding side of things, um, I think a little bit, I think if you probably ask an American <laughs> consensus they would i would probably say that number is probably 80 to 90 percent they would probably say ford right. maybe in canada might be a little like i said i would say at least still probably 50 percent. but i think also the brand that you guys have built over the hundred year history that you guys have obviously is a huge factor into why people also pick you guys as a product too oh well thanks james yeah it's uh it's pretty neat the history and actually coincidentally i've had the opportunity to go down to it was on a uh, a bachelor party of all things for my friend Sean, but we went down to to Michigan to Detroit to Dearborn, um, and we all have a a general interest in cars, and so we got to tour the Ford Rouge plant and uh, also the Paquette Avenue plant, where uh, in the early 1900s Henry Ford was really um, sort of uh, really mastering the the model the Model T, and hearing about. Um, the the foundations of the company was actually very inspirational and and I'm a lot of that DNA is still very present in the company 
and it's also a good reminder for the company to to look back at at those 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 beginnings because Henry Ford wasn't the first person to build a car. Uh, he was something like 250th registered car manufacturer in the Detroit area. Um, he wasn't the uh, biggest at the time, but he found ways to really make it accessible to people by taking a no frills approach to it. Let's cut out some some of the frills. Let's make it very simple, very user friendly, and very affordable. That was that was the big thing. Um, you know, it, a fraction of the cost of some of the other uh, automobiles out there because he wanted it to be accessible to uh, to the masses. And I think that's a good reminder sometimes for for car companies to be like, hey, let's let's take into account that not everybody can maybe we have to have options for everyone. So. Um, and then hearing about his commitment to efficiency, vertical integration, all that sort of thing, the assembly line, the ways he, he revolutionized modern production, uh, was really inspirational. So, uh, yeah. And then we want to make sure we carry on that legacy in a positive way. Um, but not going to also just rest on those laurels of, of the past. We got to stay relevant. And that's why, um, I am excited that Ford's been a little more, um, on the, on the leading edge of, of the electrification. We're still very happy to operate, and, and it's still a very important part of our business to have gas and diesel engines as well, uh, especially for, for certain environments. You know, it's good to have options. Like I said, there's never one size fits all. No. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really neat to see the way they've, uh, they've come along. Yeah, and I think one thing I did also want to touch base on is obviously the last time we talked 11 months ago, Again, we were kind of just getting into this a little bit of an economic kind of unstable unstable environment that we were seeing. And now, 11 months later, we're still kind of in the thick of things, right? Um, I see a lot of things on social media and obviously in the news and stuff. And obviously, a lot of manufacturers are obviously having tough times trying to sell vehicles right now. But the one thing I've really kind of pinpointed is that Ford never seems to be on those lists. Now, I'm not saying that you guys obviously aren't probably having a tougher time than you guys maybe three years ago or even two years ago would have, but it's interesting to see that any of your models on any list I've seen, and I've seen numerous lists from numerous kind of news outlets and influencers and that kind of stuff. And this is all just from like public knowledge or public data. Like it obviously gets released when like quarter numbers come out and stuff, but it's always interesting to see that ford is never on those like lists of struggling um vehicle models that are hard to sell right now so like what like what do you think you guys are doing different that kind of puts you guys aside of everyone else that you guys aren't really having those kind of struggles where like example jeep for example i think three every list that i see three of the top 10 is just jeep alone and it's like okay like what are you guys doing differently that doesn't end you guys up on that list? That's uh, yeah, that's a good question, James. Thank you. I think it takes a lot of uh, a lot of listening, and and you have to be very adaptable. Thankfully, the the motor company, even though they they will make bold stakes and bold stances on things, nothing's ever permanent. Nothing's ever set in stone. So they've had to really um, think on the fly and adapt some of the programs. Uh, programs referring to. Uh, interest rates or incentives on vehicles to help support uh, vehicle sales and, and volume of sales. Uh, so we've noticed, you know, back in the uh, back in the COVID times, you know, there wasn't much of that going on. Now Ford's really brought a lot of that back. Where even very recently, we saw a lot of uh, Black Friday uh, cash that was helping support vehicle sales. So that's in either in discounts or rebates. Um, Ford. Even though Ford Credit is uh, Ford's sort of proprietary lending arm, um, they will still have to buy down interest rates uh, because they borrow at a certain rate, they finance at a certain rate. But they've they've actually they're they're unselfishly leaving money on the table because they want to provide people those lower rates. That's how you can see, you know, a one point nine nine, which a couple of years ago wouldn't raise any eyebrows, but now compared to market rates 1.99 looks like a steal you know what i mean <laughs> and that's a that's yeah. a great point because even again kind of a little bit off topic but 14 minutes ago i haven't looked at the news yet but 
the Bank of Canada was supposed to decide on rates again. I know that doesn't really impact. Obviously, it impacts you guys a lot less. But again, those rates and mortgage rates also had a huge play into why rates on new vehicles and used vehicles also went up, right? Oh, yeah, they're actually... I would, yeah, I would say, James, there is a pretty big ripple effect with with uh, the interest rate decisions that that we've seen, and and so whether it it directly affects the lending rate of vehicles that are sometimes calculated on on the uh, the base rate, or um, if it's just other areas of people's life getting more expensive, they're having to pay more for housing, they're having to pay more for groceries, uh, for fuel, um, with with taxation too, separate, but. Uh, still, still uh, an interesting topic to discuss as well. Um, yeah, if, if they're just generally feeling that their life is getting more expensive, and they have less uh, available funds for, uh, I wouldn't say a vehicle is a discretionary spend for a lot of people. It is right up there with their, you know, housing, food, shelter because they need to get to work, they need to drive their family around, they need they need to be mobile. Um, but maybe when it comes to those those extra purchases or or Maybe uh, the, the the fun the fun purchases uh, with the vehicles um, we don't see those as much these days because yeah uh, people are feeling the squeeze. I think that uh, yeah I'd be curious to see what happens in the in the coming months with announcements of if we're going to hold steady if we're going to um, you know slowly fall down. That's always the saying, right? Is that interest rates go up like a rocket and they come down like a feather very slowly you know, very slowly coming down. Um, I think that would alleviate a lot of the, the stresses that we see in people. You can kind of feel it in the air, especially in the service department when people are coming in. They've got a lot on their minds. You know, life's not getting any easier for them. Um, so uh, hopefully that hopefully we can find a good sustainable way to go forward. But yeah, um, I'm thankful that, that Ford has, has come up to the plate too. Uh, from an, uh, an automotive manufacturer perspective, to to provide some lower rates on on some vehicles to help support the, those sales and keep it steady, because it it could be uh, could be a lot worse. And um, the inventory situation has almost done a bit of a 180. Whereas I think when we we spoke last, supply was still a large concern. Now supply has come back, thankfully. Uh, there's there's a lot more supply out there uh, comparatively than there was in the past. And so now it's almost uh, the opposite problem where now we have lots on the lot and uh, their units are, are moving as quickly. People have had to cancel orders and things like that because other areas of their life have gotten so much more uh, expensive. So, um, but that's just getting back to being, being adaptable and, and, and listening to, to people first instead of telling them what they need. Let's hear from them what they need, what they value, and then and work with them to, to find a, a good solution. And that's an interesting point you bring up because even 11 months ago, uh, we were talking and basically our whole conversation, or a lot of it anyways, was inventory, 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 um, how the model of dealerships really go. And I know we talked really about kind of like the Tesla model where basically you just go in, test drive like one model or they have like one model of each vehicle that you can test drive and then you order it and then it just shows up however months later, right? Where now it's almost kind of like the complete opposite is where like now there's like, it's kind of back to where it was before the pandemic is where like now you're getting so many more um, deliveries and there's so much more inventory on the lots now. So it's like a complete like 360 from 11 months ago where we thought, Oh, like we're going to kind of see a model shift. But even now, like if I drive by any dealership, like I'm seeing tons of vehicles where before I never did. Mm -hmm. That's right. So yeah, it's it's uh we're we're happy to see it come back. Uh, we're not going to complain about it because it's it's nice for for consumers to have options, um, especially when they haven't over the last couple of years even been able to maybe see in the flesh the vehicle that they're ordering. So now we can say yes, this is similar to what you'd be ordering. This is the paint color. You can see it in the daylight. Um, little things like that matter to people. Like you know. How do I know I'm going to like the color? Or how do I know I'm going to like the seats? Or little things like that. So now at least we have units on hand that we can uh, provide that, that tangible experience for them. And and then, uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's kind of an interesting thing to see how, how it progresses. Um, I think another thing, too, is uh, a lot of companies are still 
as you mentioned, James, rethinking the way they do um, supply vehicles to dealerships and, and what that looks like. So there for I don't know how much I can really comment on here. I'm trying to remember what's because uh, there are some things that are still up in the air, I'll say. So I'll try to avoid those topics. But um, with EV specifically, Ford has really started to do more of a almost like a I don't want to call it cross docking, but where they kind of instead of okay, you order a vehicle. It gets shipped from the factory to the dealership, and that takes a long time. Um, it seems direct, but it's really, it can be kind of a, a clunky process. And Ford's really been trying to pare down the number of permutations and order combinations that you can have on a vehicle. Um, so that way it, it simplifies the manufacturing process. The so fewer options you have, um, you know, instead of having, like at one point, I think there was a stat you could build like a an F one fifty like nine thousand different ways with all the different options, which is a lot of complexity when you're trying to manufacture at scale and with quality. Um, so they've really focused on simplifying that, getting that down to a, a more manageable number, and with that, then they can start doing this thing that they were talking about doing, which is kind of having these regional lots where um, you know you can only get say a mach or a Lightning and, and a couple of different combinations. So they, they build those to keep factories going. They ship them to those regional holding centers and then they can fulfill orders faster uh, from those regional uh, hubs. So it'll be interesting to see how that affects uh, you know supply chain and, and whatnot. And there's all, all kinds of things uh, still being talked about as well when it comes to um, yeah, the dealer role versus the company role and pricing models and things like that. But that, that, maybe that'll be our next episode. <laughs> yeah, because I know we talked about it earlier in the year where we kind of thought that the model was going to shift, like I said, to more like the Tesla model where, right. you, like I said, you just come in, you test drive, and then you order and it shows up, right? Um, mm-hmm. And then that basically for a dealership, they don't have to hold as much inventory and have it just sitting there and obviously if you guys are sitting on inventory obviously you guys are losing money but it's still interesting to see like even like maybe not like in guelph but like if you go to a bigger town like if you go to a mississauga or toronto like for example the one of the one of the mercedes benz in toronto just built like this massive like huge showroom in dealership and it's just it's interesting to see that like some some dealers like i said are kind of evolving and changing this model then others are spending so much money on the real estate side of things and the building side and building this extravagant showroom and it's just like i don't again i don't really know if there's a right or wrong answer but like to me like from from looking from the outside in like i don't really know if that's the way that like you want to kind of go with the future like have this massive building and hold all this stock and just hope that it sells because it's Mercedes or BMW or whatever brand it might be. It just it's kind of interesting that companies are taking that route, even as we've seen through the pandemic, that the model has evolved a lot. Yeah, you're you're right, James. And I think that's that's it. Like kind of getting back to what we were talking about earlier, but there there really is no one size fits all. Some people are totally comfortable to transact fully online and then they just come in when their vehicle shows up and they're they're happy as can be other people really want that in-person experience they want to get in it they want to sit in it drive it um so i think providing both options to people is important and i think that at least in the, the short term um it'll kind of almost be a blend of of those two call it the the old school way if you want to and then the the tesla way or the new school sort of um simplified way uh it will see a blend because uh, you know depending on your experience buying vehicles or your perhaps your your age or, or what you're comfortable with people like to transact in different ways so as long as we don't uh restrict those ways um to, to the to the guests uh you know then that why would we want to uh exclude people say by nope you have to do everything online and um, if you can't do that, well, I'm sorry, Ford's not for you. We want to make sure we still provide that that warm, welcoming um, environment in person and have units on, on the lot to, to provide that 
uh, to, to folks. And, and that's kind of something we've been really focusing on well uh, as well as stock has come back. Uh, people have a lot of choices out there. Um, again, in our own little bubble here, our own little market area, there are a lot of a lot of choices. And then also just, uh, you know, if you want to call it nationwide, uh, people have a lot of options when it comes to where to buy a vehicle, um, you know, geographically, brands, et cetera. There's, there's a, you know, it's almost overwhelming how much choice there is out there. So what can we do to differentiate ourselves? Try to really focus on culture, uh, provide a, a welcoming environment, um, you know, a, a low pressure environment, just kind of what would you want when you're buying a car? You want to feel comfortable, you want to feel heard, uh, we want to feel valued so we've been really keying in on that and continuing to provide that as a way of differentiating ourselves a hundred percent i think the one same in your business too right a lot of choices out there for insurance and and so what makes the difference the service exactly and that's and that's the biggest thing and i'll I'll tell you a quick story that again kind of left a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth a few months ago where i went to a dealership I'm not going to name names or anything, but yeah, it's just a good idea. <laughs> um, just went to the dealership. I was literally probably on the lot for 20, 25 minutes. So I was there for a pretty long time looking at vehicles. And I was pretty disappointed that like not one person came out and even wanted to talk to me. Right. Again, I might be a little bit different. I'm a little bit old school. Like I kind of like to still have that social interaction with people when I go to the like those kind of things and i was just again i was just kind of a little bit disappointed that no one even took the initiative to come outside and say hey like even just like sh- like just shoot a conversation right like just mm-hmm. say like hey like what's going on like all this kind of stuff like don't even have to try to sell me on this line but even just come out and say hey like how's your day going like just kind of just generalized conversation so i i was just a little bit disappointed when that happened right yeah and that's that's a I'm glad you brought that up because that is a common thing as, as much as, you know, some people don't want to be, uh, you know, approached or, or made to feel like they're, you know, going into the shark tank of, you know, oh, this is a car dealership. Uh, you know, I, it, you need to still have those those interactions and, and build the rapport with, with folks. And, and yeah, you want to feel like you matter to somebody, you know, you want to feel like, okay, they they care about me here. They they took the effort to, to come out and speak with me. Maybe it ends up in a sale. Maybe it doesn't. But at least they made the effort. And making the effort is so important and something we really try to encourage our people to do here is just make the effort. Um, and, you know, at least you've done that. That's what you can control. You can't control what the, the, the guest wants to do or, or how their mood is that day or you know, you never know. There are a lot of factors you can't control, but you can control your your initiative, your work ethic, and and yeah, people people like that they that human contact. You know, they they want to feel like they matter. I think another kind of conversation I did obviously want to bring up is I said I kind of alluded to it at the beginning here, and I said that you guys were kind of like that founding father almost in the push for the electric vehicles and the hybrids and stuff, but we are seeing. A lot of companies obviously jump on that kind of band, bandwagon now where, again, you have GM that's coming out with their Silverado. Who knows how long that's going to take? Obviously, I'm a Ram guy. Ram's coming out with their electric vehicle. Who knows how long that's going to be? But does that drive... That's got to drive competition, right? That, that's got to obviously kind of be, okay, like, what are they doing? And then now we can kind of do we can kind of go one up or not really one up, but we can kind of improve what they're doing. Right. It, it does for sure. Yeah. That that's uh that's a very good point. Like we, and we, we welcome that competition because we want to, you know, if you're, if you're the only show in town, you don't really, it's hard to get a benchmark for how you're performing. So when there, when there are other options available, that's when you really get into, okay, how are we stacking up against the competition? And um, I think that's where, since Ford has already had a couple of years under their belt now of building these electric vehicles since 2021, really. Um, so a couple of years of production, they, they will have again, refined things, um, you know, made tweaks in the quality. Whereas that first run um, for, for 
some of these other manufacturers, it, they, they might encounter some, some challenges. Every, everybody does along the way, or they might be flawless and that'd be great. Uh, you know, it's good, I don't good, think good anyone's ever that, flawless. <laughs> hat, hats off to them. But, but yeah, I think that's where Ford can kind of say like, Hey, we, we were experienced in this. We've been doing it for a little longer. And if that means something to you, then, um, give us a, give us a try, consider our brand. And, um, I think another part too, is we're also, we've, gained a lot of uh insight into the the user experience already uh at ford so um we can relate to to the, the customer experience of driving an ev a little better because we've been dealing with it for a little longer you know and and by participating in the uh the ford model e training that's what they they call their uh division of electric vehicles uh model e as a kind of a nod to the model t um by participating in model e training we we're really uh, focusing on being a trustworthy and knowledgeable EV destination. We want folks to feel like they can get the answers that they need from a trusted source at our at our store. So um, that's where we can kind of uh, differentiate ourselves as well. Whereas some of the other manufacturers, you know, they've got some some catching up to do, maybe, or others are are have been doing EVs for for a long time. Like I, I have to. Um, you know, give uh, give my regards to, to Chevrolet. They've been really, again, very very bullish on the uh, on the EV game and and have provided some some great EV product out there. And and uh, so you know they they're learning that too. So it's kind of a good healthy uh, bit of competition. You know, you wanna you wanna play against the best, kind of like sports, right? You wanna play against the best to prove that you're the best, and it makes you better uh, by playing against the other. Uh, best teams or best individuals why do you think i golf with you all the time <laughs> <laughs> oh man james you flatter me come on no we hey it's uh we're all learning that's that's the thing and uh like in golf or or in business you know there's there's always learning to be done that's very kind of you to say um, you know what though i always yeah. kind of forget about it that they actually do like they have the chevy they have the they had the vault they had the that's spark true. i believe as well and the bolt has yeah. been popular for yeah. them. So, yeah. like, it's it's. The, the, I always kind of get biased because I drive a truck, and I'm like, oh, they don't have a they don't have an electric truck yet, right? So it's just mm-hmm. it's it just it's funny that you don't really think about those things, and it's like, no, they actually they, like they've had electrics in the past, right? And it's and and to your point, like we have obviously it was so funny the conversation was EV EV EV, and then it's kind of like almost transitioned to where you said earlier, like a lot of. Uh, manufacturers have kind of gone to this like hybrid model Mm -hmm. and that's that's uh partly due to the fact because they're keeping an eye on the on the sales numbers for for the evs and seeing the adoption rate and and some of that too is you know realizing that it's not going to be the whole market it's going to be a segment of the market so ford actually just recently announced that they're they're kind of scaling back some of the the investment that they're making in ev and that's okay you know, uh, things things are like we were talking about before. Things are never guaranteed. Um, you have to adapt on the fly. It doesn't mean that they they they're considering this a failure. Um, you know, it's not not in any way is it a failure, but it's just readjusting the strategy uh, to make sure that that we we're giving people what they what they want and what they need. So it's it's going to be, um, yeah, it's going to be a part of the future. But it's again, I think hybrids are the the natural stepping stone maybe if you're considering electrifying in some way but don't want to go in a full cannonball you know into the pool you can kind of wade into the waters with with a hybrid get comfortable with it um you'll notice the fuel savings right away um it's incredible and then and then maybe eventually you make that that jump to an ev and that's something too that i i I've heard more and more stories about just like the cost of ownership with EVs. And um, I've had a few stories that I can bring up uh, because again, we, I think we touched on this in the last episode up front. It does seem like a bit higher of a, a price uh, to pay for a vehicle, but when it comes to the, the maintenance side of it and the cost of ownership, um, you know, the charging versus fuel alone, um, again, estimates range, but an easy way to think about it is, uh, every say every two thousand kilometers, um, you know the average person might spend, depending on what you drive, say three maybe four hundred dollars worth of fuel, depending on prices and the size of your tank, how much you drive, 
I wish I spent that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you have a truck, when, maybe when it's I, a little higher, right? When I go to the gas station, it's just like, oh, here we go again. Like, <laughs> oh, no. I do a lot less driving than I used to. When I used to work in St. Catharines, it was terrible right. because I used to fill up almost twice a week because going wow. 70 kilometers there, 70 kilometers back with mm-hmm. a truck, it's not very fuel, fuel efficient, right? So that yeah. kind of was a pain. But now with it the less is. driving, it's, like- it's not bad. But still, it's like with the gas prices and they kind of stabilized a little bit. Like I'm mm-hmm. not going to sit here and, and lie and say, Oh, do I ever think it's going to get closer to a dollar ever again? Probably not. Um, but again, right. like even still, like for example, like my girlfriend's dad, he's got an older 25, uh, GM 2500 and he's got the big tank. In it. And I think every time we go to the gas station, whenever we're towing or something, it's easily two two fifty. It's like, geez, like this is a lot of money. <laughs> right. Yeah. And those are those are real tangible dollars uh, that uh, if you can kind of bundle everything together when you bundle in fuel costs, oil changes, maintenance, um, and then compare that to the, the lifetime ownership costs of an electric vehicle. It's really where, where you can pick up some some savings. So like, say for that example, again, <clears throat> pardon me for the uh, for the 2000 kilometers, um, you know, charging. Um, could cost you anywhere from maybe twenty five dollars to fifty dollars in that in that sort of range. So if you're picking up, you know, three hundred fifty four hundred dollars worth of savings um, every two thousand kilometers, you can do the math and realize, okay, this is paying off. And um, and especially if you're charging at home on the the ultra low um, ultra low hydro hours, um, if you're doing the right things to to take care of your electric vehicle um there were a few tips i wanted to mention at the ev training that came up that i didn't we didn't really know about initially so uh one of the big things they that they encourage folks to do to help um with the range of the vehicle is called preconditioning and what that is it's kind of like you know how you have remote start and it heats up your vehicle and kind of gets the, the temperature up maybe turns the heat seat on for you you can do that with your ev as well but if you do it while it's still plugged into the charging station, it, it saves the battery life um, so that you have more range when you actually hit the road and start driving. Um, Interesting. All that preconditioning. So it's, it's kind, kind of like of a, a diesel, right? Like when you need yeah. to turn your diesel on, it has to run for a bit. You can't just turn the diesel on and just start just going down the road. It's not good to do that. Exactly. You're priming it for your trip, but you're not using the battery to prime it. You're using the charging station. And that way it saves it saves you some range. Uh, another thing, this was a bit of a, a, a bombshell in terms of uh, information. We really, you know, we were kind of excited about this, but all to, to know about this for the lifetime health of the battery. But also we were kind of like, hmm, that's an important fact for people to know. So I want to make it really clear that uh, the official word coming out is that um, the optimal charging percentage for your EV battery is 80%. I've heard that as well. Yeah. And and that's not something that I think people people consider. Why would I only charge to eighty percent? You know, doesn't that mean less range? But in terms of the health of the battery, kind of like cell phones. Remember certain phones. You know, if you you it kind of went through the same um, uh, evolution of things. Where yeah, so you want to be charging to eighty percent. Only maybe in a in a desperate situation. Um, do you do you go beyond that if you know that the next charging station is not for a little while? Okay, but uh, but usually eighty percent is a good um, the good cutoff. And then also with rapid charging, this is another one. It's kind of a um, a catch twenty two in a way. Uh, if you need the rapid charging, absolutely. But they say if given the choice, if you have the luxury of time, using a, a slower charger is is healthier for the battery. Um, because it, it's a more sustainable way for the battery to, to charge. Um, so those are just a couple of, of care tips for folks out there that might be driving EV. They might, that might be old news to them, but it was, it was actually, it was interesting to learn about that. And then um, another thing they, they've they come out with is uh, some conversions on home charging. This is kind of uh, a bit nerdy maybe, but I'm a stats guy. So if people are kind of curious, well, how fast really does it charge? Because initially, it really depended upon your your hydro service, your charging cable that you were using. So now we've got some more 
kind of real time stats that I could share if, if that's of interest. A hundred percent. Okay, very cool. Uh, thanks, James. So, um, so for example, the sort of the smallest charger that you could use is the the one twenty volt uh, charger. Um, say you're using that on a on a twelve amp rating. Um, so that one hundred twenty volts times twelve amps gives you one thousand four hundred and forty watts. Um, so to put it into a, uh, a relatable context, one hour of charging on that 120 volt gets you five kilometers of range, and then you can do the math out from there. So if you plug it in overnight, say eight, out or eight hours of charging, you're only going to get about 40 kilometers of range. And that might work well for uh, somebody who drives a plug-in hybrid vehicle, where the battery range on those is only about 50 to 60 kilometers in all electric mode. So that, that might be that might be just perfect for that. You know, that's that 40 kilometers is really all they might need. Um, if you go up to the uh, 240 volt uh, charger, that's kind of like your kitchen plug for your stove. The, they call it a NEMA plug. Um, with a 32 amp rating, you can charge uh, 32 kilometers worth of charge in one hour. So again, that same eight hour charge now overnight gets you 256 kilometers worth of range. So without even having to install a charging station, just using that 240 outlet, uh, which you can have installed by an electrician, and uh, it has to run an, on its own dedicated line, but it's not a, as big of an investment as, a say, a charging station would be. You're still able to get overnight 256 kilometers of range, which is, um, I don't know, I know some people might do more than that in a day, but I certainly don't. <laughs> so that should be more than enough uh, charge to, to get you where you need to go the next day. And then finally, if you do end up uh, upgrading that to, say, a, a 48 amp uh, uh, rating on the 240 outlet, um, so that would be they have uh, charging stations that will provide this, um, you can get about 360 kilometers uh, of, of charge in, in an eight-hour time frame. And then up from there, if, if you're using a, an 80 amp level two or a, a, a level three charger, it's going to be even faster than that. But those are just some, some stats that I think will help maybe comfort people on, on the charging side of things. Oh, the charging's too slow. I'll never, it'll never be ready for me in time. Actually, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty fast even on the 240 so i think what a lot of people kind of wrap their head around or they have a hard time wrapping their head around is that i can go to the gas station fill up in two minutes i can be on my way right so i think a lot of people hold i don't know why because realistically i don't it doesn't really matter to me but like i I think they just hold so much value in that like they can just go Mm -hmm. do it two minutes and they're on the road again right so it's just i think it's just obviously about changing the culture and changing the mindset of people and just saying hey like yeah, this might take a little bit longer, but w- what what are you gaining from this, right? And if mm-hmm. if there's a positive gain from it, I think more people will jump on board and say, you know what, yeah, like that, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, yes, I'm gaining time, but I'm saving X amount of dollars every time I'm doing this, right? You nailed it, James. Exactly. That's just it. That and that that shift in perspective is it's what what's going on right now, and hopefully. Um, you know, more and more folks see the value in that. But yeah, thank you for making that connection. That's just it. And and some people are, are uh, you know, it is a lifestyle adjustment a little bit. Uh, you know, you have to be um, very, you have to be a little more uh, strategic about it and, and coordinate uh, your charging. But thankfully, you have something that Ford does to make it a little easier for you through the Ford Pass app, which is like their, their vehicle owner app, which is free to use. Um, it uh, it allows you to map out your trip, finding Ford approved Blue Oval charging network uh, stations along your route, so you know that okay, if I'm going from here to Montreal or Ottawa, I know I can make these stops along the way. These ones are free. These ones charge you to charge. Um, these this one has a level two. This one has a level three. It estimates how long you'll be stopped there for. So if you know you're going to be stopping for food or something, anyways maybe a little, uh, rest stop, um, you, you can kind of plan your trip around it. Before you even leave, you don't have to improvise on the fly. It'll tell you what chargers are available if somebody's plugged in there. 
if it's if it's available so and how um, many times do you do that with a gas vehicle right like you're on a road yeah. trip and then you're like oh like where's the closest gas station and you're trying right. to like google it and you're like i don't know where it is you're in the middle of nowhere i now have to get off the highway oh now i have to drive another 10 kilometers into an actual town because i'm in the middle of nowhere right so mm-hmm. again there's pros and cons on both sides and i think realistically at the end of the day it just really depends on what your lifestyle is, right? Like there's for never sure. going to be a right or wrong answer for every single person. It's just going to be, yes, this is right for me or no, it's not right for me. And then you kind of make your decision from there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So ho- again, hopefully that helps uh, provide some comfort to folks who are worried about making that road trip with an EV. Uh, you can actually have it planned out and it will adjust in real time. Say you're, you're, you're using a bit, say that the, it's getting colder or if with the uh, lightnings uh, you know a lot of people tow things so if you're towing if that impacts your range it will adjust um, the time for it which is really neat and uh, that was actually something we got to do um, at that model e training was was tow uh, a, a heavy trailer using an f-150 lightning and how, do you tow with your truck at all james i'm, I'm not very often to be not honest with often. you like i may be in the two, almost three years I've had my truck, I maybe towed maybe less than five things. So it's, okay. for me, I just don't, I don't need to, but I know yeah. a lot of other people do. And that's yeah. a big talking point, obviously, right? If people do tow, they're like, am I going to lose power? Am I going to lose range? All that kind of stuff. So it, it does adjust the range on the fly. But the most impressive part about it for me is um, when I've towed other things in, in the past with a, with a gas or diesel engine, there's that leg, right? Where okay, we got it. You can feel we've got extra load here. You got to step on the gas and get up to speed. And if gradually, you know, you can hear the engine working a little harder. Um, and with the lightning, it was like, is the trailer even attached? <laughs> it was instant. The torque that that truck can generate um, with the heavy trailer on the back, it was just instant right away light as a feather um so that was something that was that was really impressive um and uh yeah other than that uh on the capability side um you know we we also got to try the what ford calls blue cruise which is their version of uh autonomous driving in in a way so um it's hands-free driving uh that, that network is expanding they have the u.s pretty well fully mapped out uh in canada they've got some 400 series highways um some other i know at least in ontario from from my perspective they've got a few other uh ontario highways mapped out as well so that you you can set the blue cruise take your hands off the wheel and as long as you keep watching the road you're you're driving hands free which for somebody who wants to embrace that kind of technology is a great thing for for ford to have it will even change lanes for you um, you know, it'll regulate speed, regulate your your uh, gap distance between you and the next vehicle. And it was funny when we were doing the demonstration, we, we actually kind of freaked some people out because, you know, people know with with a Tesla, oh, OK, I know some of them have the, the self-driving feature, uh, but they don't really expect it from Ford. And then they see us with both hands out the window waving at them and they <laughs> they were a little nervous. But uh, but no, it's just neat to see that that technology come along. Is it, for, it you know? Is it is it for everybody? Maybe not. You know, some people will always want to. I'm I'm a two hands on the wheel kind of guy. But if you want to embrace that type of technology, it's nice to know that Ford has it available for you. One hundred percent. So those were a couple of things I really gained from from that Model E experience, and and it's just uh, again, um, you know, kind of. Uh, it's not what you might expect from from an established company like Ford. They're really trying to be cutting edge with these things and uh, push the envelope, right? Enjoy, it. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think one thing I do want to obviously touch base with before we kind of end things is a a topic that kind of really hits home with my industry with insurance and obviously with you guys mm-hmm. is you have must have seen over the last year, into last year, and obviously into this year the high number of vehicle thefts and it is killing the insurance industry. And I keep telling everyone that based off these and obviously other factors, maybe not in the insurance industry and in the insurance industry, but rates are going to continue to go up because again, when companies are paying 
over a billion dollars in stolen vehicles every single year. It's wow. it's very very hard to again, and it's it's hard to explain this to someone because they think insurance is a legal thing. They think it's a service, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I always say, you know what? It's a business as well. If the business isn't profitable, there is no business to be had. So how does a business become more profitable? Unfortunately, they have to raise their rates to get profitable. Again, we're seeing numerous people have brand new vehicles stolen, $100,000 trucks, $100,000 SUVs. And again, like when the industry is paying this much out, it's obviously going to have a ripple effect, not only from the insurance standpoint, but obviously into your guys' sector, because then obviously people are coming back, they need to buy new cars. So have you guys had that kind of come up in the last year where you've had clients and they're like, you know what, I need to buy a new vehicle, mine got stolen? Unfortunately, we we have, and and you're you're so right, James, it's it's sad to see what a common issue it's become and uh part of it is just uh you know some of the technology is is a lot more advanced but it's still not it's not theft proof right and it's not uh you know the the, these these thefts that we've seen a lot of customers have actually come in some of them they've got it all on camera you can see what they're what these uh these thieves are doing um ways there and it's it's highly highly advanced stuff it's not like oh i left my keys in the car they opened the door and took it yeah and it, um, in yeah nine times out of ten it's not it's not yeah. that it's literally they're they're walking by you in the mall and they're scanning your keys in your pocket and then they're basically tracking your vehicle and then picking it up later that night or they get to you they're randomly just get like driving in a neighborhood they see your car in the driveway they go up to your door they scan like they scan a, your wavelength from the door to your key cuz your key mm-hmm. might be 10 feet inside the door right a lot of people mm-hmm. still hang their keys right inside the door so the wavelength from the the transmitter that they have to the key is like instant right and then they just go to the car it replicates that wavelength your car is opened on and gone right so most of the time, it's not people leaving their car unlocked or leaving their keys in their car. It's a lot. It's it's technology that has basically taken um, a, a a signal and is basically replicating that signal to then turn on the car, unlock the car, and the car is gone. Mm-hmm. It's true, and it, it is uh, it is alarming uh, to, for people to see that and, and see how seemingly easy it is. But even then, um, you know, there's still lots of ways that you can. Some are more analog ways, and then some are more uh, like program uh, software type of ways that you can help help mitigate these sort of things. So I know some folks will store their keys in a um, like a radiation like an RFID proof. Yeah, a lot um, of companies are starting box. to like do that now. Where like they'll, mm-hmm. like for example, like the Hamilton Police, I know like they do like a a program every year where they like they'll give them out to people just so that they can obviously use them. And again, it prevents more of these thefts that we're seeing from a technology standpoint. Yeah, for sure. And uh, there, there are some modules that you can add into the vehicle as well to help with, uh, with vehicle tracking um, that are available uh, through, through your local dealer or, or garage. Um, some of them are, are an actual module that goes in the vehicle. Um, others are, they'll have a, uh, etching they call it or or markings that they can put on the vehicle so that if it gets shipped or or chopped or sold for parts they can help help trace it back that's sort of more of an after the fact thing uh when it comes to the the modules in the vehicle or even uh ford has a feature called my key uh where you can set certain settings uh, on the truck uh, or or car through through the connected uh vehicle modem that can actually help you in in the event of a theft. Um, again, I I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but I know that uh, there are ways that you can set even on your key. This is kind of an interesting thing too. So you have teenage children or something, you don't want them driving too fast. You can set a speed limit on the key, so you know when you give that key to your children, they can only drive a certain speed. You know they're not going to be flying one fifty down the four hundred one or something like that. Um, <laughs> one fifty down the woodlawn, and <laughs> yeah, oh, that would be wow. get, get in the, the F one race there. But uh, 
yeah, or or there are ways that you can actually remotely disable the vehicle uh, in the, in the event of a theft too. So uh, thankfully, like companies are are committed to, and and I know Ford's committed to making their technology safe and secure, um, using more encryption, using more advanced methods. Uh, but it is something to always keep an eye on and and just have your wits about you. And and if you do have any questions about how to make your vehicle safer, uh, reach out to an expert. Again, like what we were talking about with the internet, sometimes there are a lot of myths and things out there, maybe misinformation before you spend money on something that you may or may not need. Um, you know, feel free to give give us a call or contact your local your dealer or a trusted person in the industry. Um, see what they think, and uh, hopefully we can help curb this. Uh, this trend that's that's been happening that's that's not the, the trend that we want to see in the industry and even from like an insurance standpoint i know you kind of just talked about the etching and stuff and that's kind of a big um that's been a big play on the insurance side of things is a lot of companies have partnered with the company called tag and um they've been putting these devices or these etchings in vehicles to basically track them in the event of them being stolen and unfortunately, um, even from my side, um, the Ram is like one of the most stolen vehicles in Canada, but the F-150 is also a top five stolen vehicle in Canada as well. So mm-hmm. it's definitely good to know your options. I know some people, they don't want the tracker. Or they'd rather do a kill switch. And again, it just comes back to, you know what? One solution might be good for Doug one solution might be good for James, right? It really just depends on who you are and really how you want to protect your asset. But at the end of the day, it's, it, yeah, it's just, it's very upsetting to see you spend X amount of years saving up for this new vehicle and it could possibly get stolen. And again, it, if it's, it's stolen and in less than eight hours, it's not even in Canada anymore. So it's just... Right. And especially odd. even though the supply situation has improved, it's still not perfect. So it might take time to, to replace that vehicle exactly. uh, as well. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully we find, find a lot of, uh, like a lot of efficient ways to, to keep those vehicles on the road. Uh, yeah. And then, um, you're right though. There's, there's never one solution fits all, but, um, yeah, as the technology advances, um, just don't be afraid to ask questions when you're taking delivery of your vehicle to to make sure you know all the options available to you. Uh, we get a lot of folks that maybe come back to us and say, "Oh, I never knew the the, the truck had that," or "Oh, I would have used that if I uh, if I knew about it." So just making sure that if you have any questions, don't be shy about asking. Nobody's nobody's going to judge you for for wanting to know about about a vehicle that you purchased, and if they do. That's the wrong attitude. They should welcome your questions and help you find the answers. And uh, that's the, the, the culture we try to create at our store. So uh, I always say it's yeah. so easy to get the client, but the the hard job is keeping the client afterwards, answering their questions after the fact. Because realistically, yes, you can get a client, but the way you kind of service the client afterwards is what keeps them with you, right? And what mm-hmm. keeps them coming back and buying another F-150 every three, five years, right? Like if you're answering their questions after the fact, they're coming in for service. Like you actually treat them like a real human being. That's the real value. Yes, I can sell them a vehicle. And yes, it's one more number on our bulletin board every month that I'm selling. But at the end of the day, like if that person buys from me once and I never see them again, like, yes, great, it's a sale. But at the end of the day, it's like they're not a reoccurring person coming in and referring us business, right? So mm-hmm. the hard part really happens after they become a client, not before. Yeah. But it's effort worth making. And that, that's what we've, we've found. It's those relationships. You can't, you can't even put a value on, on those relationships. And, and also, too, for, for consumers, it, it matters where you buy. You know, uh, going to see James, coming into Wayne Pittman, Ford Lincoln, Making that choice, um, because there are a lot of choices out there, matters because not everybody's going to take care of you the same way. And and so really just consider that. I know there are a lot of factors to consider when making a purchase or, or servicing or, uh, you know, when you're getting uh, you know, insurance quotes, things like that. But, but who you who you buy from, who you choose to bring your business to matters because you want to make sure they're there for you. Like you were saying, James, a- after the fact, too, that's when the real work begins in some cases. So, uh, yeah. 
ending it off here, I always have to end it off with kind of a one one topic you kind of want to leave with the listeners. If there was one thing you'd like to kind of summarize this whole episode with, what's the one thing you'd like to leave with everyone moving forward? Oh, thanks, James. Yeah, I, I would say that just, um, you know, get out there and experience these things for yourself. There are changes in the industry. Um, don't be shy about coming in, experiencing it for yourself before you dismiss the technology or maybe listen to some hype around, oh, this will never work or, oh, it's not for me. I'm this kind of person. Um, I've always known this way. Just try it out for yourself and experience it. And that way you know for sure um, whether or not it's it's for you because you might be surprised. I know uh, even, even my uh, some uh, friends and family or staff who thought they would maybe never drive an electric vehicle finally got to drive one and now they love them or you know they never thought they would um, want a hybrid um, but once they realize that it doesn't really change their their lifestyle too much uh, or at all in some cases it's not a huge adjustment to make and, and uh, yeah just get out there experience it for yourself don't be afraid to ask questions um, I guess one other thing too if it's okay James before we uh, wrap up here I know you want to wrap up um, it was just like on the on the vehicle care side a big trend that we're noticing too is if you're hanging on to your vehicle for a little longer talk to uh talk to your trusted uh, industry professional or dealer about extended warranty options because we it always uh kind of it's, it's discouraging to see sometimes when folks have maybe been holding on to their vehicle for longer than they anticipated they didn't uh protect themselves with with the extended warranty and now they've got a big bill that they're facing um and and it, it could have been uh, at least mitigated a bit by having some kind of extended warranty. Um, so it, that's another thing, too, to look into. Crunch the numbers, see if it works for your budget and your lifestyle. But uh, a lot of vehicles nowadays with the, the modules in there, um, some of the advanced electronics, it doesn't take much uh, for, for for those those repairs to get expensive. Um, but having that warranty is a nice safeguard, kind of like having a robust, insurance plan right you want to make sure you've got the coverage that you need um so that you're not faced with any unwanted surprises i couldn't have said it better and i appreciate you coming on today like i said i'm always super excited to chat with you because you kind of come you really come to the table with a lot of knowledge and again it's really nice to kind of get education out there and you know what at the end of the day like if if listeners can go you know what like you know what doug really changed my mind on this i'm actually gonna go try it then at the end of the day like we're at least making a difference for people where other times it's just like oh i'm i'm not gonna do this because i hear so much news in the media or whatever whatever news outlet i'm i'm seeing i'm i just don't like this it's nice to kind of expand your horizons and kind of get a different viewpoint from others other than just the same outlet over and over and over again Exactly, James. Yeah, very well said. And thank you very much again for having me on. It's a, it's a really great, uh, a great joy in my life. And it's a, it's a pleasure. And thanks for providing the, the platform for us to have these kind of conversations. It's, it's important. And yeah, the more we share about it, the more we kind of dispel some myths and uh, provide some unbiased uh, information, or I try to be as unbiased as possible, you know, uh, just makes every, life better for everybody. And, and Thank you very much again for uh, for your time. It's been yeah. a pleasure, and I can't wait to have you back at the uh, the charity event this summer. It's gonna be it's gonna be a lot bigger, a lot better, and yeah, I just can't wait to actually get out on the the course again. And I know it's only December, but it's like my my I'm itching, you know, like yeah, it's just oh, like same here. Wait, we'll have to get into the sim a few times, and uh, we'll keep the swing in check. So yes, I know the <laughs> swing needs to stay in check. The driver has been coming out. I has will it? say oh, that good. it's. Good. I've been I'm dusting glad. it off a little bit. It, it has. I've been. I've made a few minor adjustments, um, like weight and stuff in certain areas, and and kind of adjusting it a little bit. So it has been helping. It's not. It's a work there in progress. Go. Still, I'm not going to say I'm. I'm uh, a PGA pro at any time soon. But you know what? The dust is kind of being coming off, and good. I'm. I'm. I'm grinding the rust away. So just like we were talking about. Be exactly. Adaptable. Don't be afraid to try new things. It's all good. So hopefully by the summertime or springtime, I can kind of get the driver down where I'm not like four holes to the right. Yeah. <laughs> I can keep You'll be it. doing the George W. Bush. Now yeah. Watch this drive. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully come that time, I can kind of keep it straight. And at least I can kind of change up a few things. And after that, I need to start working on the, 
Uh, my next biggest thing is going to be uh, my woods off the fairways and stuff. I just, I, I always just, I top them like crazy in the fairways. So I use my irons all the time, right? Because I'm just so comfortable with them. So, but hey, we definitely can work on it. I know the putter's money though. I've oh, seen that in action. Yes, the the putter is. Um, <laughs> I will is my biggest pride in in my golf game is the putter and. Everyone that plays with me, they're like, man, like, did you like take putting lessons? I'm like, man, I just, it's just, it's He's the part of my truck. game is just, that's like, I just take so much like pride into, into putting. So, you know what? Like, I'm glad it, and you know what? Sometimes it's not always on, but I would say like majority of the time, that's like my one piece of my game that I can always confidently say, you know what? Once I get it on the green, I'm probably never going to three putt this. It's a good piece to have. That's for sure. It's an important one. Yeah. Well, thanks yeah. so much, James. This is a blast. Yeah, and thank you for coming on, and we'll check you guys next time on the Broker Breakdown.